Broadcasting live from the Phoenix Business Radio X studio in Tempe, Arizona. You are tuning in to Culture Crush with Kendra Maples. This podcast will dive into a variety of companies that are crushing it with a great company culture. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Culture Crush Business Podcast. On this podcast, we focus on everything surrounding businesses with a good company culture. We talk with company leaders to learn about real life experiences, tips, and best practices for creating a healthy work environment. Today is no different. Today's a little fun though. Instead of filling the room with too many voices, I get the chance to focus on just one today. So today we have Rick West, the CEO and co-founder of a company called Field Agent. And um, it, it'll be, I'm excited. It's probably a good thing we don't have anyone else in the room, right? Because when Rick and I had the chance to talk before actually doing the podcast, I always talk with all of our guests and we were on the phone for almost an hour. So <laughs> <laughs> now it's probably good. It's just you and I. So Rick, welcome. Oh, Kendra, thank you so much. I was so looking forward to this day so we could reconnect and continue our chat. Right. I know. Yeah. And, and now it's fun because we get to record and we get to share the rest of the conversation with everyone else. Exactly. I'm excited. Awesome. Well, me too. So, so first off, let's, let's hear a little bit about you. Who, who are you kind of, what are you doing now? How did, how did you get to where you are? And then we'll dive into more about field agent in particular, but tell us about you. Sure, a little bit about me. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a movie buff, I like TV shows, movies. So I come from that era. Yeah. And, and I tell people that I'm a, uh, a combination of hillbilly elegy and Friday night lights. <laughs> and so if you're a reader, both great books, the, I mean, the, the hillbilly elegy by J.D. Vance, fantastic book that came out a few years ago. Ron Howard purchased the movie rights, had a movie that came out about, I, gosh, a little over a year ago with Amy Adams. It was just fantastic movie. But I look at that combination because I'm probably, Kendra, probably the first guest that you've ever had that grew up in a holler in Kentucky. Oh, a, a, a legit can't... holler. I mean, I'm a, I'm a true holler. hillbilly, right? Nice. Uh, so I, I, I bring you that up because if you understand anything about hillbilly elegy or Friday night lights and where they come from, it's all about culture mm-hmm. and hillbilly ele- elegy. It's, it's that the culture of family, what it means to have a name, your name means something and you carry it. And Friday Night Lights is that culture of the high school and your town and your community and you win, you take that with you. And so for me, it is very much, um, it, it's something I carry with me. And so uh, I grew up in a coal mining town. I grew up in the head of a holler. Uh, both my granddads in some way either worked on the railroad or the coal mines. My dad was a railroader and my brother works in the coal mines today. So Kendra, he is probably a mile down on the mountain today wow. as we're speaking, uh, digging coal and the coal he digs is metallurgical coal. And it's the only thing that will melt steel. So without the coal that he has, you couldn't melt steel and produce what we have today. And that's what he does every single day. I'm so proud of him. He, he's a, a great worker. He leads a team. It's so, so cool. But I grew up in that environment, but I was also one of those kids that while it made me who I am today, Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't want to stay there. I I really wanted to, uh, I just didn't want to work in the coal mines, you know? And and so there's a, there's a part of it to be proud of. There's also the safety issue. There's all the things that surround it, but that culture comes with me. So I'm this kid that grew up in Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky, and I went to the great you know, University of Kentucky you know, for the basketball tickets. <laughs> uh, but, but what happens with that is that as I got away, my graduating class, a couple hundred kids, probably 30 or 40 of us went to a, a large school, quite a few community college kids. It, you kind of make it on and realized, okay, I'm going to be that kid that left. Mm-hmm. And when I come back, I'm always going to be the kid that left and came back. Mm-hmm. Uh, my brother used to laugh and he would say, Ricky, come home and talk like a city boy. Uh, because the accent is so strong yeah, uh, and so deliberate. And then I had to learn to articulate differently. I, it took me all through college and probably my first year of working for Procter & Gamble to completely eliminate my accent to the point that my original supervisor said, I'm never going to take you on a client call if you can't lose A, the word you mispronounce, 
and B, the dialect. And that was tough. I mean, my, my freshman year in college, you about the culture. I came in the culture. Kendra, I started school and did not own one shirt with a button on it. Huh. T-shirts, concert T-shirts, football jerseys. That's kind yeah. of jeans. I mean, it was this, this look. And I go to an ultra preppy, you know, three polo shirts flipped up, pinks and yellows, mattress pants, just the whole thing. And I thought, what have I done? <laughs> uh, and so I had a, a good friend on my floor when I was a freshman. Uh, they all wanted me to rush a fraternity. And I thought, there's just no way. And by the time I finished my freshman year, I said, yeah, this is something I could do. He said, but Rick, you can't wear what you've got. It's not going to work it. So Kendrick, he is, these, these are two kids that were almost 19 years old. He took me to the mall. We went to a version of like a, uh, a Dillard's or a Macy's. And he helped me shop for my first pair of Bass Weegians, fantastic sho shoes, the loafers, <laughs> right? Duckhead khakis, two polo shirts with a button down, right? So a blue and a white, a blue blazer and two ties. And he helped me do that so that I could rush a fraternity, go through the process and fit in. And so he just kind of saved me and helped me kind of navigate along those lines. I can tell you the same story when I started work for PNG and didn't own a suit that was a wool suit that matched versus khakis and a blazer. Uh, I didn't have a pair of wingtips. So I had a really good person, a friend of mine, take me alongside and just really help navigate me through that. So all that being said, this culture piece came with me and I needed, needed to learn to adapt, mm -hmm. uh, but it's still very much who I am today. I draw from it every single day uh, that I do something, the culture that came with me, yet I've adapted over time. And I think I've taken the great pieces of that, mm -hmm. incorporated it into who I am, but also left other pieces back because sometimes, Kendra, you need to leave things back over there. Uh, from what you came. So that's a little bit about my initial beginning before I get into the work world, corporate world. That's a little bit about me. But I love that because, you know, when we're sitting in this room and we're sitting over, over video, having this conversation about culture, right? We were talking about culture in terms of businesses, right? What's the culture inside the business, but there's all of these other cultures and pieces that that factor into that, that lead into that and roll into that to, to build the culture. And I love that you took the moment to tell us a little bit about, you know, where you came from, because that is what makes the culture of a company, not just that people look different, right? Um, right. last month we had Darren Thompson and Brian Moore here on the show. And we were talking a lot about, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? And, and having that mixture of people, but I'm glad that you're talking about your past and where you came from, because it is more than just what we look like, Correct. right? It's Correct. more than just our colors are different, um, male, female, that kind of stuff, because it really truly is everything about bringing a team together, your background and where you came from very different than, than mine. Yes. Um, not too different. I, but I wasn't, you know, in <laughs> out in the, the hillbilly areas like you and, uh, you know, but bringing teams together, that's a huge piece to look at is not just, Oh, well you, you guys look the same. Yeah. But look at where we came from. Right. And, and, and I think that it's so, so important uh, for us to think that we're going to leave our culture at home, mm -hmm. our origin of birth. I mean, the 18 years that we grew up in a certain household and now all of a sudden we go to four years of school and they, we graduate and we start with this company and we're going to leave all that culture behind is naive. It is, it, life doesn't work that way. Now, that being said, you are entering into an, and a part of a new culture, but you should be able to bring with you the good, mm -hmm. adapt to other good. And then we all realize that there's probably some things that we probably do need to either grow out of, move out of, but there's, there's so much good though. And, yeah. and that really is the diversity of thought that we're talking about. Um, the, the attitude that, that I have in uh, not leaving anyone behind, having relationships, standing up for those that need to be stood up for. Those are all things that I grew up with mm -hmm. that most people wouldn't consider part of the culture because they would see the negative part, the coal mining, the, the, the rural aspect of it, the backward nature. And I said, well, yeah, that's fine. I can leave that. 
but there's mm-hmm. so much good of that culture and the, 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 the way you come alongside a community and you would fight to the death, you know, for these people you grew up with, even though you're not related to them. I mean, that's what you want to bring with you to an organization. Yeah. And so that's been pretty cool. I love that. That's awesome. And then, so tell us a little bit now about field agent and what you're doing there. And then obviously we'll get into what you're doing with your people there. Sure. There's some things that you and I talked about before that I want to bring up. So tell us, you know, at the root, what is field agent? What are you guys doing? Yeah, it is, uh, as people are listening to this or watching the video clips of this, there's really two facets to what we do. If you were an end user, a person that was going to make money using field agent, you would download the app and you would see that it's kind of a mystery shopping type of app where you can um, download the app, open it up, and you could say, gosh, while I'm shopping, uh, I could go make some extra money by taking a few photos or answering questions in a store, or I could have you buy a product and try it, maybe do ratings and review. I could also ask you to do insights and research. So there's a part of this that I would argue, Kendra, that I'm probably the only person that's been on your on your show that can actually pay you money today because you've downloaded your app. I can pay you cash. Write that down. I, I can actually pay you cash today. <laughs> Daryl's writing it down. <laughs> Write it down because I, at a minimum, I'm going to help you either get a pizza or an adult beverage. I'll help you do something today that's going to help you on your way home. So that's that part of the mystery shopping. Everyone listening could play. And it's so fun. We're in the, the U.S. and seven other countries. So it's fantastic. The other side of it uh, is really the marketplace effect. And so we have this marketplace that people are trying to solve things at retail. So if you needed to understand competitive intelligence at a retail store, if you wanted to know pricing, if you're trying to understand if a display is up or you need more ratings and reviews, you literally go to fieldagent.net, go to the marketplace. And within three or four clicks, you could launch a ratings review project, get some photos in a store. In just a matter of three or four minutes, you're getting this amazing retail intelligence coming your way. So we have two ecosystems that we focus on. Uh, and then I like to tell people that we're also one of these 11 years overnight success stories. <laughs> you know, we actually launched in 2010 and we launched uh, pre-selfie. So in those days, there was no front facing camera. There was no video unless you hacked your phone. But the iPhone 3S had just come out. It was the rage. You had a two megapixel camera. And that's what we were using. And we were trying to determine whether or not people were using smartphones to capture data inside of stores. And no one was doing it. So we said, gosh, if that's the truth, why don't we, while we're still managing five LLCs, we had all these other entrepreneurial startups. We started working nights and weekends again for about six months. And myself and two other co-founders, Henry Ho and Kelly Miller, launched this field agent thing to be a tool for our company. And after the first year, realized this is the one thing we could scale. So we get rid of all the other LLCs, started focusing on field agent, and that's what we're doing today. And and tell us the growth since then, because you named just a couple of people that you were working with since then. But now you have, you know, a decent amount of people that work with you. And we've talked about, you know, people that have left and come back again. Yeah, so it's all about alumni. That, Absolutely, right? all about alumni. Oh, so for us, it, it was it, we had two companies over here. I had a thirty-person company, a twenty-person company, and a five. And those had unique cultures. The, the research group were they were thinkers. They were more quiet, more introspective. And I had the marketing people that were out there. And let's go have the next meeting. It's great. And so you're managing through it. But within the culture of field agent, we started out with five people. Quickly went to twelve. And your listeners know that automatically at about 12, you, you have a, a, a change, right? Yep. And then within a couple of years, we're in that 25 to 30 range. Uh, and today we're hovering just under 100 people. Um, Guys, I think it's about 85 full-time, 15 part-time, and four or five interns. And culturally, that's a dramatic change than where we were two or three years ago. So uh, the first probably two or three years, we had no levels, no titles, really, really flat. We were all this, this amazing band of brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. Well, when you start to get to scale, culturally, you think you can stay the same, but you have to have levels, you have to have divisions and reporting. And so we've learned from the corporate world that I came from for 17 years, and I took the good from that. Mm-hmm. And then we took up the startup mentality, put those together. Uh, and really, we think we've created something special from a culture standpoint. 
So with coming from, you know, 17 years of corporate and now you're in this full on entrepreneurial mode, right? You've got these other companies that you've gotten rid of. You're putting towards field agent. How walk us through, explain what that looked like just from the very beginning, from knowing that culture was something that was important and you've brought from your corporate world, the positive pieces you've brought from your childhood and, you know, um, rushing in college, you're bringing all of these things to the table. What does that look like? Now you're in entrepreneurial mode, you're, you're growing, but you've got to, you know, figure out, like you said, right around that 12, 15 people is when you're like, ah, we got to figure something out. (laughs) It's not, it's not small enough where it's just a a small team and it's easy. Now we're, we're over that cusp. Now, what do we do? What does that look like? There's a, there's a couple of things Kendra, as, as we look at it. So, so the first one would be, I, this is Rick's personal opinion. I could be way wrong, but I guarantee you there's several books that would reinforce this. I just can't rattle them off right now. We'll find but, them, don't worry. but over the last 10 years, if I've learned anything uh, specifically with field agent, you've got to bring people along so that they can see that they're a part of something that's bigger than themselves. You just have to. Oh, hey, I work for a tech company. Well, that's not <laughs> really, that's it. I mean, there's there's thousands of them. Well, hey, I have a really cool job because I get to do this thing with an app. Well, that's uh, why well, I work in a really clean environment. It's the fun location. You work in an old Coca-Cola bottling plant and it's really, really cool. And they have a ping pong table. Eh, it's, it's more than that. And so I start out when I'm coaching young entrepreneurs saying, your product isn't the issue. How you structure is an issue, but people are going to stay with you because they're a part of something bigger. Now, in our case, we started out from a faith standpoint. We wanted to make sure people could bring their faith with them, all faith aspects of things, and to make that a part of who we are so that we serve the community. Mm -hmm. We don't serve the community corporately. We serve the community individually. So your passion may be working with orphans. My passion might be working with the marginalized. Uh, Someone else might say, gosh, I really want to help uh, infrastructure and disaster relief. Mm -hmm. And we're going to come in and say, yeah, let's be a part of that, as opposed to us saying, hey, we're only focused on working with the needy. Mm -hmm. So it's bigger than what I am. Now, there's also a business side. Uh, Listen, our why and our how and our what is that if you're a Simon Sinek person, our why is, is we exist is because we help people when it retail. Mm -hmm. And we do that through a marketplace and we have these products. But on the culture side of it is that I can come in and uniquely be me and be a part of something bigger, which is taking that faith and integrating into everything that I do. And that was kind of that first talking point that I that that I tell people, what is the thing that's bigger? I, I think the second thing that matches up to that is you have to have a large enough and a large enough umbrella that multiple people can play under it. It's not such a big idea, but a very narrow, big idea. Mm -hmm. Because if it's narrow and big, you're still going to eliminate the 80% of the folks who are like, well, I appreciate it's a really big idea, but I don't see how I fit. So it needs to be a broad enough umbrella that feels like, oh, I'd love to be a part of that because I can bring who I am and participate. So that's that was really the first big idea that we had. And I would argue in many ways, kind of a big experiment. You know, could we not have a corporate structure down, top down mentality? Could we have a bottom up, but yet have an umbrella for people to play? And that was the first big experiment that we started with. I love that. And then how has that been working? Has that changed? Has that shifted? Yes. So part of it for us is, um, it's the analogy, you you know, you can feed someone or teach them the fish, right? There's a parable in there. And yep. so for us, what you'll find is that any given time, we we have this structure that if you participate, and let's say in this case, you want to work with an orphanage in Guatemala, mm-hmm. say, Kendra, that's great. So here's what we'll do for you. One, we'll do matching funds. So whatever dollar you put in up to a certain dollar amount will match. So great. Well, then the second thing is, if I'm you, Kendra, I'm going to follow my money. So we'll provide up to a week of extra vacation to go follow your money. Then someone says, yeah, but I appreciate that, but I really don't have the money to go take the trip. Well, hey, we'll split it in half with you. We'll give you a stipend. You have to have some skin in the game. Yeah. So now I've helped you on the financial side. Uh huh. Okay. I've helped you with the time mm-hmm. and I'm hitting where your sweet spot is. 
if you choose not to go be actively a participation participate, that's okay. But that's how we kind of have evolved to individuals doing things. And now we're saying, how can we come alongside? Even to the point, Kendra, you would come back and say, uh, we had this one person that was working with Afghanistan widows. Oh, wow. And uh, it was one maker. Her name was uh, Jana uh, Harp. And she came in saying, yeah, I need the money. But you know what I really need? I need marketing help. I need some financial help. I need to understand how to work a production line. And so our team came alongside her and we gave her free consulting and brought her in just like a client. So while money was important, you could follow up. What was really important to her is we came around and now think about this. You've got a chance to help Afghanistan women. You didn't have to travel. You didn't have to drive, but your heart can be right there. And you can take this business skill that you've learned and we gave them an opportunity to participate. So for us, whether it's a local thing here and you want to work because of disaster relief or you want to work with the marginalized or you want to go do something around the world, our point is culturally, where's your heart? Where's mm-hmm. your passion? Follow your money. We're going to come alongside you. And if others can participate, great. And so we probably have, again, of the, of the 100 people, we probably have 40 or 50 pretty active people in projects. Okay. Some take parts of it and others are pretty active. And there are others that are, that they can't wait to take the next trip because we're feeding their passion. And then the team comes alongside and says, okay, Kendra, when you go, I'm going to back you up. Mm -hmm. And then when I go, you're backing me up. And so it's very team driven. But again, the big idea for your listeners would be, it's not a corporate down mandate that we're going to focus on this. Mm -hmm. It is individuals coming alongside and we're enabling them to fish and we're coming alongside them. Mm-hmm. And is this something that, I mean, cause I know from when we've talked and you mentioned it today too, that you brought in this faith side of things to the right. company and the culture. So as far as this piece that you're talking about with supporting everybody and their, their, their why, right. And what they want to do. Is this something that came from you in particular or the rest of your leadership team? Because there's, there's different angles and, and I'm listening to you and I'm just like, I'm like full of butterflies. I'm like, this is how it should be. This is what a good culture is about, but I'm sure there's other CEOs listening going, oh, we don't have money for this. Yeah. So, so think of it from a practical standpoint is that I came from a corporate environment. Again, one of the the best companies in the world, Procter and Gamble. I highly recommend if you can get a slot there, you should go work at (laughs) PNG. But PNG was very, very specific. We support United Way and the Fine Arts Fund, period. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I really want to go work with this local, you know, we support United Way and Fine Arts Fund. Yeah. But my passion, you know, we support United Way, Fine Arts Fund. (laughs) And so we, we took that up saying, yeah, we had a lot of giving people at PNG. But if that wasn't your thing, it just wasn't your thing. And like, well, yeah. well, so that was the corporate part. We said, we want to learn from that, where PNG was a giving, giving millions of dollars, but it didn't touch the hearts of everyone. It probably touched the hearts of maybe 10%. Mm-hmm. Where well, the other 90% had to take that yearning to go do good outside of the company culture and go make it over there. There was no match. Yeah. And that was the piece that we realized was a huge miss as we look at it coming from a, another environment. And so the, the big idea was culturally bring people in. How do you bring a large enough umbrella to make that happen? Uh, and there's still some people, we, uh, we had a local company that just needed some construction done. We're like, let's just take an afternoon and go make that happen. But what we didn't do was saying all 100 people have to show up. Here's the slot. You have to go do it because that's not really what we're trying to do. We're trying to change hearts and come alongside people. I'm just so happy that we're having this conversation <laughs> recorded this time. But, but it, so, so one more thing. So, so if you're a CEO listening, mm-hmm. um, let's think in our case, we match up to $1,500 per employee. For Again, this. For, for, for any, for, for the matching, if, if okay. each year for every dollar you put in up to $1,500 uh, and you say, gosh, you know, how do I fund that? What does it look like? But now when you think about benefits coming in and you're telling someone, I'm giving you $1,500 to spend across any passion you have, as long as you put your money in first, mm-hmm. that's a great retention thing. I mean, this and our, our folks like this is fantastic. We, we tout it as a benefit that you get the extra week and you get a stipend and you get this and 
for people that have a passion. Now, think about the type of people we're bringing in now. Interest now, be, let's be selfish. Let's be self-serving CEO here. I want people that care about others. I want people that give. I want people to be not concerned about themselves, be a part of something bigger. And now I've got this cultural thing that bring it in. So it 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 is like a magnet to the type of people we want to hire without saying, I want people that are going to give, that have a certain caring nature. You can't recruit that way. But when I put this out, it just gravitates. People just jump right in. Mm -hmm. And and every culture is different, right? That's yeah, why it's yeah. such a hard thing to pinpoint what to do and, and how to do it. But what you're saying as far as having this program and having it be part of the retention, you are recruiting. It's a retention and a recruitment tool. You are yes. recruiting the right people because the people that maybe wouldn't take advantage of it, they're probably not going to apply. They, do, they don't look at that as a perk where right. I'm going to look at that and go, awesome, because I have a passion supporting veterans. I have a passion supporting animal conservation. So I would look at that personally and go, that's awesome. I'm already contributing to these things. Why not join a bus and join a team that's also, you know, supporting that other people. Like I said, there might be some people out there that are like, eh, it's not really what I, I don't, I don't worry about that. Then that's okay. Then it's not necessarily that marketing tool for them. It's right. the marketing tool for the right people. And then think about your recruiting standpoint, you get back into the culture piece. I would argue that success most often follows the path and depth of relationships. That's a, that's a tweetable little quote there for you. Okay. Cool. Success, it follows the path and depth of relationships. So we have a relationship now we're talking about this. We're now having coffee with friends because of the relationship. I tell you about this thing at work. You're like, oh my gosh, that's great. The next thing you know, I've recruited you in. Now I've got more of my friends, more people like me that have common cause. I mean, it just builds upon itself and it really is relationships. Um, I, I tell people often, Kendra, I've never had a job that I had to apply for. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I was always recommended and provided an application. So whether it was at school, prior to school at PNG field agent run. It. I mean, it, it was all because I had an amazing relationship and someone said, Rick would be great at that. Mm -hmm. And they brought me in because the relationship side of stuff. And so this all ties together uh, of getting this like culture kind of thing. And then if we do it right, mm -hmm. it's going to be self-sustaining. Yep. And that's the best type of marketing is when you're referring somebody because like you mentioned earlier, okay, yeah, you guys are in an old Coca-Cola building. Like, that's cool. But that's not really what people are telling their friends to recruit them for your company, no, no, you know? And no. and we've said it before, you know, there's the companies that have the free coffee and the snacks and blah, blah, blah. But that's not what you, that's not what you're telling your friends at the end of the day. No. At the end of the day, when your friends say, you know, hey, how's that, how's that job of yours? you go, oh my gosh, I just went on this trip. I was provided an extra week of vacation to go do, you know, whatever um, support thing you chose, maybe veterans, or like you said, the widows, like that's the stuff you're going to tell your friends about. And that's that recruitment tool. And that's I, your people are then your marketing, your best marketing. Yeah. So now if you believe that is true, let's, let's, let's say that all the listeners are like, oh, I love Rick and I love Kendra. You guys are so smart. I love it. That's if, you follow that, <laughs> if you follow that analogy and you take it a little bit further and you truly believe that the people under your care as a CEO, you really operate with open hands. You truly have open hands that the people that I'm mentoring today within my company, they may choose to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. If they choose to go somewhere else and I have open hands, I'm saying, gosh, let me help you find a position somewhere else. Let me help you engage in some way, if they leave and they take part of the culture with them, think of the, the reach now of a hundred people to a thousand to 10,000, mm -hmm. because culturally they, they brought this piece with them that was really important. And the DNA starts to kind of ooze into other organizations. And, and you and I talked about this last time is that we also have uh, alumni that come back. Mm -hmm. um, there's every party we have, whether it's a tailgating party or a Christmas party or a summer event, we always invite alumni. And these are people that worked with us in the past and they may have worked with us five years ago. We still invite them back and 
gosh, we're in the process of recruiting someone right now and he needs to tell us yes, because he's going to come back and he's been gone about three years. Our director of people was gone for about 18 months and she came back. Wow. So they'll go back, your hands are open. Mm -hmm. And then while they're out, we're still mentoring and come alongside them because it did just because they're not working for us, Kendra, doesn't mean that we don't still care about them. If, that, if that's the case, how fake was it when they were here? Yeah. Or we didn't care about them. Yeah. And, and when it happens, you'll have a good portion of them come back with new experiences and they, they brought in their perspective. Uh, and so that's been a really, really cool part about our culture, which is open hands, encouraging mm -hmm. out and then having open hands to bring people back in. And that's been really fun to watch. And I think that is actually one of the things I was most excited to talk about today from our conversation before, mm -hmm. because so often you talk about the culture of companies and you talk about how the culture starts at the very beginning of onboarding and, and how you onboard into a good culture. But then even there's a lot of companies out there that they, they do have a great culture but then there's this stopping point of when the person leaves when the person leaves it's oh see you later you're not part of our culture anymore but that's what i love about how you guys are with the open hands and how you're saying imagine if they take all of those amazing things about your culture and now they go to another company and okay maybe they do come back to you guys which is great but what if they do stay at that other company what if they help that company what if the culture pieces that they took from field agent are now infiltrating other companies and helping right. those companies improve. And they're taking these ideas and they're, they're going to this new company going, Hey, I used to be able to do this at my other company. What do you guys think? And imagine that trickle of change mm -hmm. when you do have people leave and and it doesn't mean that they're leaving because of anything bad, right? People have oh. to leave. They have to grow. They have to try new things. And then, hey, maybe they do. And they go, ah, I'm moving back to mom's house. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> it's, it's better there. I'm going back. But giving them the opportunity, right? And that was one of the things that I loved when you and I talked before, because there truly are great companies out there. But unfortunately, right. I see time and time again that, when they leave, it's, they, they kind of take it personal, right? It, it is. And so can you imagine that you're, um, you're a director, VP, executive level person in company A, and you've been mentoring uh, a young woman who's 27. And you just like, if you just hang in there with me, I know the director role is going to open up and it just hasn't opened up and you keep pouring into them and you've, you've been coaching them. And all of a sudden she gets a chance of a lifetime to make 30% more to get a director stripe at another company, not a compete, not a competitor. We're not trying to, you know, put over yeah, you know, okay. people over there. Over there. <laughs> and then you're like, well, if you leave, then fine. I mean, really? I mean, that's not going to work. Now imagine that same conversation happening. You're like, okay, I know we can't do what we need to do here. How can I help you? How can I help you interview? How can I help you with your resume? I want you to be successful. When that person leaves, not only is she now the best recruiter known to mankind for our company. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Not only can she help us outside of that, but more importantly, now she's an amazing director and all this stuff is working out great. Now you've got a VP role over here open and you're trying to recruit and bring in someone says, well, what about Sally or Sue? You're like, oh my gosh, forget about them. Here's Kendra. Remember she left. She's now spent three years over here. I'd love to have her back. Now, when you pick up the phone, or you're texting back and forth, Kendra's like, yeah, right. I mean, you wrote me off. You haven't had coffee with me. You used to mentor me and now you didn't care. Now she's going to say, gosh, even in my current position, we still have coffee. You still engage. I've had some questions. Why wouldn't she want to come back? And so that's the open-handedness aspect of things that we as leaders have to understand that not everyone is going to stay with us forever. It's not realistic. And we want to be a part of something bigger too. As a CEO, obviously there's the company, but you want to be a part of the ecosystem in your community. You want to make your community better and you have all this grow up so that your legacy 20 years from now is look at all the people I've planted, all the people I've helped. And that's a really cool legacy to have. Yeah. And so if we have, you know, CEOs and leadership level that's listening right now, do you have any other ideas or suggestions to help? Because I, and I asked this, but now I'm going to give a side note. I feel like they know that they need to do these things, right? They know that they need to try and be 
open arms and, and try and make that transition easy. But at the end of the day, the reality isn't there, right? That, right. that they're saying, Hey, I, Daryl, I get it. You need to go somewhere else. Let me help you search for a job. Let me help put in a recommendation. It's very far and few in between that actually do that, but they know, right. That companies right. like you that are doing it and saying what they're doing and supporting their employees and then getting them back later, right. They, they know that they have, they, they should, but they're not. Do you have any, any other thoughts or any other ideas to help encourage that behavior? I think the, 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 a couple of things. The first one to encourage the behavior is I know deep down inside, it's going to crush your soul when your favorite person left and they just didn't choose you. Mm -hmm. I have been there. Listen, my, my son-in-law is going to listen to this. My son-in-law worked for me and he left the company. Ooh. But, <laughs> I was like, oh. That's okay. <laughs> and my daughter's like, it's okay, dad. It's okay. <laughs> but, 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 but even within that type of engagement, I, I know it's hard and I know it's, it's, pr it's practical nature. So sometimes it's, it's almost like you're too close to it. I was about as close to that one as I could possibly be. So sometimes you have to step back a little bit and let others you know, have that because again, as a CEO, you're not a mentor to everyone, but it really is whoever has that mentor relationship should be coming along. I think the other side is, is the thing is don't beat yourself up too bad because Kendra, I would probably get, and I should know this number, but I would say probably half the people, and we don't have that many people to leave, but when they leave, probably half the people would give us a two week, I was afraid to tell you, and I'm leaving and I'm going to move on. Mm -hmm. And the other half would say, here's what I'm thinking. We come alongside and we help them. And when I go back and backtrack and look at it, it's because there was a broken relationship over here or they weren't bought into the vision. Mm -hmm. And so I don't beat myself up over someone giving us two weeks notice and bolting over here. That's okay. Because not everyone, it's not going to be perfect for everyone. So as a CEO listening, don't beat yourself up, but you know, the people I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, it's those people. It's the ones you're like, I can see they're going to be successful and I want to help them be successful human beings. Shame on us if we don't come alongside them. Mm -hmm. And if the relationship and trust is there, they'll give you a window and you'll see the window and how you react is when they now tell their friend, Hey, I'm thinking about leaving. Should I tell Rick? And they're like, Oh yeah, you totally ought to because here's what's going to happen. That's so, so important because the community is going to hear that and it's going to come in. So I don't have a magical bullet, but I do know that you can't beat yourself up because it's not always going to be perfect. And I'm telling you, people talk yeah, and, and they are going to let everyone know what it was like when Rick just said, away from me, you mean nothing to me. And, and that's just not okay. And, it, and like you said, people talk, right? Yeah. It's both sides. When somebody leaves a company right away, everyone else is asking questions, Yeah. right? Well, what happened? Like, was it, you know, you hear that people don't leave companies, they leave bosses. So people are going to think about that. And, and the questions start, you know, so if you, if that employee who left had been supported through the whole process, then like you said, they're your best advocate. Mm -hmm. Cause then they get to say, oh no, 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 no. It was nothing like that. You know, I just, I, I really was ready for a growth opportunity and it wasn't available at that time, but Rick helped me step-by-step step and has helped me through the transition. And now I'm with this other company and they get to advocate and right. right Cause they're going to talk, right. they get to tell everyone else, no, 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 that's not what it is. It was a great transition as yeah. opposed to if it is that employer that gets mad, takes it to heart and goes, nope, see you later. Well, they're going to talk about that too. So here's the recommendation I make to people. Now you could, you could say, Rick, that's not fair, but here's my recommendation. So if you were looking for, uh, if you're applying for a position, it's not that hard to figure out who left the position. Mm -hmm. It's not. My recommendation for people is it'd be great if you talk to that person, but they're probably not going to tell you too much. Mm -hmm. Find that person's friend and say, so why did Kendra leave? Mm -hmm. They're going to say, oh man, it was <laughs> a cesspool. <laughs> this boss was terrible. Or they're going to say, you know what? They just needed to move on. And it was a great experience. They were probably, I mean, so you can find that person. It's not that hard to figure out. Go to LinkedIn and find out who they're LinkedIn. You say, oh, yeah. hey, what's going on? And they're going to tell you so much truth. Yep. Well, 
if you're an executive trying to recruit, do you really not think that people are not going to check up? Really? Yeah. Totally are. Totally. Especially so, today. It's yes. so easy. It's yeah. so easy. You, you can, like you said, find who had that job, that position before, or even going on to LinkedIn, you know, you type in the company, it already says how many connections you have to the yeah. company. Yeah. So find any of those connections, right? It's, it's so easy to do some research and, and find the right company and find a good company and figure out why people left. We, we have technology at our fingertips right now, which makes all of that, which, which honestly probably makes it harder for people now with some companies that don't have a good culture, right? Yeah, it does. Because it is so easy to find out. Yeah. But I think the principle as people are living, if you're saying, guess what were they talking about? It's mm -hmm. the open hands. If you truly believe that you are mentoring and developing and coming along those that are with your company, if you operate with an open hand, mm -hmm. I'm telling you, it's going to come back two, three, four, five fold, even better. Uh, it just comes back around and, and you have to look at it that way. You're naive to think that you can be brutal and tough and be the, you know, they left me and this is what's going to happen. It's, it's going to bite you. And so you can't do it. You've got to have open hands. Mm -hmm. And I love that you call them alumni. Yeah. Yeah. And so tell us a little bit, you told me last time you guys do like the potlucks and stuff or barbecue. Yeah, yeah. you invite them back. What are some other examples of some of the things that you do where you get to bring those people back? It's obviously it's the, the fun parts of the party stuff, right? Yeah. We have a birthday party every year. They've come back and we have a Christmas, you know, kind of event. This kind of a giving event. We bring them back for that. And it's kind of, you know, dress snappy, casual, have a really fun time, you know, making that happen. Uh, but there's other things that, uh, We'll have a, I can't remember, the, it was like a leader cast thing where we had a live feed and we purchased the live feed. Well, you invite some of your alumni back and say, hey, if you want to come and sit in our great room, maybe have lunch with us, just hang out and you could watch this. So it's really looking for any opportunity we have just to make it available. And it's just easy to say yes. Now, sometimes some things cost money. You say, okay, now all of a sudden we've got 75 or 100 alumni and you invite them to a party, maybe half show up, but still it's, it's real money, but that's okay. But it means something because now your employees see mm -hmm. that you're inviting other teammates back and that's exciting for them. Uh, but it's just little training things here or there that you go on, even to the point where we've attended some training sessions and you know, we had X amount of tickets we couldn't use with our team and say, hey, why don't you call up so-and-so? She'd probably love to go. So it's those little things like that that we put in front of people, especially if you were mentoring someone Mm -hmm. and you wanted to keep up that relationship, there's ways of just doing a simple ticket or a simple engagement uh, that makes all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just being intentional about it. You it guys are so good about understanding that life happens, people leave, you have to yeah. move on. And then it's, it's almost like, and I'm thinking about this because I was writing uh, cards earlier for Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving cards. I know that sounds weird, but okay. people aren't expecting them. So I right. write them instead of Christmas cards. I like um, it. but I was thinking about it because it's, 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 t there's a lot of time in that you have to sit down and write these out. And, um, you know, people that are sending out Christmas cards, right. It might be those family members you don't talk to all the time, but they're on your list of who you're thinking about. Right. Yes. And that's what you guys are are doing, even though, yes, they left, it's, you're still on our list of who we're thinking about and inviting them to the events. Or like you said, there's a live feed, invite them to join. They're still on that list of, Hey, you're still part of my, my holiday list, right? Exactly. That's a great idea. Listen, I'm a big Christmas card person. We need to get on each other's Christmas card list. We need to do that. <laughs> Thanksgiving Christmas card. We need it. to do that. Then, then they'll get mine for Thanksgiving. They'll get yours for, yes. for Christmas. Um, yeah, I switched it up. Uh, I just, it, it's something different. Nobody's expecting it. People yeah. are in holiday mode. They're thinking holiday mode and then they get a Thanksgiving day card. And they're like, I like it. <laughs> they're like, what's she doing? Um, so I want to know more about because you've done so well with being, you know, open arms with your staff and being so supportive and the growth you guys have had is, it is going so well. I want to know if you have any examples of maybe a bumpy part in that process where you thought you were doing one thing right with the culture and then it, it didn't work or, you know, something that was going on where 
you really had to, maybe you had to get some other support or some other advice on how to help with the culture. Do you have any examples of anything like that, where it was a little bumpier, right? Cause that's one of the things that I love to highlight. And I shouldn't say I love to highlight cause it's not, I mean, it's the bad parts, right? But that's how the rest of us learn is hearing some of the bumpy pieces. Do you have any of those? We're going to do a pre and post COVID. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> because we're going to a little bit yes. of, I'm going to do the easy one first, the post COVID okay. one. All right. Uh, we surveyed our team. We're talking about coming back after COVID and to a person's like, can't wait to see people. Can't wait to see people. Want to get back with my team. Want to get back with our team. We said, great. We're coming back to the office full time. And they're like, well, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> You're like, well, you said so. But, but I, uh, uh. And it was like mini rebellion. Like, oh, no, no, no. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I thought this was, I, I misheard. <laughs> And so we had to quickly rally <laughs> and say, well, maybe a hybrid thing kind of works out. But that's this one of those examples of if you learn anything in research, you never ask people what they want mm -hmm. because they can't tell you what they want. It's the old analogy of Ford would say, if I'd asked people what they wanted before I built the car, they would have said a faster horse. So you can't ask people what they want. The we made a classic research mistake instead of saying, hey, what do you want? I want to be around people more. I want to be able to engage my team. Well, of course, they're going to say yes, yes, yes to that. What we should have asked was, hey, here's kind of how we're thinking and let them react to something. And we would have quickly realized, oh, what I really want is an opportunity, at least based on teams and how we could structure it to get together. But I don't really want to come back in the office full time. And I don't want to be around 100 people, maybe 25 here. And there. I mean, we just asked the question wrong. So for us, if it's shame on us because we do a ton of research, never ask people what they want. Mm -hmm. It's hard to articulate what you want, but you can definitely, people can definitely tell you their perception or reaction to option A, B, and C. And that's probably what we should have done. So we reacted pretty quickly. Uh, Kendra, we're okay now. <laughs> <laughs> we, we survived, you know, survived that one. And go backwards a little bit and say, one of the things that we, I don't necessarily, I don't want to say struggled with, but sometimes we're a little bit too transparent. Mm -hmm. okay? okay. And uh, there's this fine line between leading and letting people see kind of the, the chinks, kind of the, the armor and where things are. Uh, and so there are probably a couple of times over the last 10 years that we have erred too far and just saying, blah, here's everything. And so because of that, because you have different skill sets, and you have different experiences and you have different tenures, there's a group of people. It's like, I'm concerned the sky is falling. Mm -hmm. I got to get out of here as fast as I can. You've got another group saying, well, then why wasn't I involved earlier? And another group saying, hey, I get it. It's just being transparent and where we are. So without getting to the details of that, transparency, just to be transparent, can sometimes be pretty painful when you've got a culture this giving and we're coming alongside each other, we want to be involved in everything and you just throw it out there. We were probably at times a little too open mm -hmm. and that wasn't good for the culture. It probably should have been more uh, uh, governed or a little bit more structured and how we laid things out to still be open with where we are, but probably could have put things in a little bit different perspective and we've kind of took it on the chin a couple of times. Now, in hindsight, I can say, yeah, but mm -hmm. transparent. They saw it. We rallied. We, we did all the right things. But I, it, it, it took some shots, and we had a little bit of pain along the way. And that was just me and a couple others thinking, nope, everyone's big boys and girls were fine. Mm -hmm. And I probably should have been a little bit slower in that. Um, you also get points because you were transparent. Be like, wow, I'm so glad. And that it's just I've never worked for a place like that. But at the same time, like, but now you told me I'm stressed. Yeah. <laughs> so we just learned the hard way from a culture standpoint that being 100% in certain areas doesn't mean it's better. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a tricky balance. Uh, it's that communication piece, right? Right. Um, I'm huge on communication. And even if it means my team is telling me stuff that I don't have to do anything with, 
I just like that open communication, right? And it works both ways. I'm going to tell you what's going on. You tell me what's going on. If it's something that needs action, cool, we'll do that. If it's something that doesn't need anything, then that's that's their opportunity, right? As you're passing that communication down, it's their opportunity to have it, store it, know it, or not care, right? Because there's some people that aren't going to want the information. They're like, I don't care, but at least you have the opportunity to have it, but that tricky balance of how much is too much. Yeah. Right? And I think for, for me, one, one of the kind of the, the life quotes for me is let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't live in the world of maybe. Yep. No one, everyone yearns for decisiveness, right? The teams crave authenticity and honesty and, you know, but at the, the, the same time, you know, yes and no's are important, but maybes are terrible. Mm-hmm. What can I do? With maybe. Well, maybe we'll, it's like, ah, really? Uh, so sometimes with that yes and the no, if it's too much of an extreme yes or no, which is kind of the example I gave, it's like, yes. It was like, oh, maybe it's <laughs> like a yes at 90. It didn't have to be a hundred, but, but no one likes the, that vagueness, you know, of, of well, I'm not really sure where Rick is not really sure what we're doing. And so that's not very good. Mm-hmm. Uh, people would rather be told no, not now than maybe. Mm-hmm. And at least then it's okay we're moving forward and this is what's happening. But again, from a culture standpoint, we start with our teams time and time again, you know, bad news travels faster than good news. Mm -hmm. Right. And don't say, well, I think I can, or maybe just say, no, I can't do that right now. I'd much rather have that and no, than thinking, well, I think it's going to work. I think she's going to try. I think maybe it's it's just not, not good. And so culturally that also helps us as well. Mm -hmm. So what do things look like for your culture as we're getting ready to go into the holidays. We're going, I mean, it's, it's going to be a little crazy this year. Now everyone's like ready to go do stuff, but still not. Um, and then you've got some, you guys are still at home some of the time now, right? You said you're back. We're three, we're three and two, we're three days in, uh, two days off. And, and we, Listen, we have great coffee here and great snacks and we provide lunch at a minimal cost. So it's really good when you're here, you know, great work environment. But we also know that there is there is the a flexibility aspect of things that people have been craving and I get the whole hybrid. So we're hybrid right now. And so uh, is this really live, live now? Can I, can I say this quietly? Is it this is. Live? Oh, well. <laughs> it's just my mom listening right now. Then as the long podcast as- comes out in like a couple of days. As long as it's just your mom, because tomorrow what we're going to tell people is that midway through December, or that Monday, the 13th, 14th, and I keep whispering, even though I'm in a safe here, I'm in a safe room, a vault, and no one can hear me. I am whispering uh, too. It's Daryl and I. We're only here. <laughs> okay. It's just the two of you. So what we're going to do uh, is let people go back to complete virtual over the holidays. Oh, cool. Because people, people are concerned, hey, if I want to go see grandma. Mm-hmm. Do I really want to be around people? Well, I need to come in the office and that's awkward. And, and then we've got a couple of people that are trapped. One person is going to uh, Europe to see some family. I mean, so we know that. So instead of saying exception, 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 why don't we just say, listen, starting on the 15th mm-hmm. through the first of the year, go back to virtual. If you want to come to the office, great. And that's going to take a huge stress yeah. off of people trying to navigate the holidays because this is really the first big holiday. And you could include Thanksgiving that you feel like you can actually go. Yeah. And we want to make sure that everyone has every chance they have. We want to make them as successful as they can be so that they feel comfortable traveling to their loved ones, whether they're flying or driving. We don't want to be the people say, oh, we just had a COVID scare. Now you can't go see grandma. I mean, I don't want to be that guy. Yeah. So that's going to change for us. So that's probably the only real big COVID change we have coming up is to have some freedom there. Okay. That's cool though. And especially, I mean, the other component of that flexibility and that stress during the holidays is kids stuff. Yeah. Like, oh yeah. My stepdaughter is off for like some ungodly amount of time <laughs> and we're like, okay, so what days am I there? What days do I need someone else to come to the house and help? Yeah. Right. So there's that whole component of it that's stressful. So, yeah, so think about that. Here's another principle for that, for the CEOs out there to look at even holidays. So, so we did this early on is that we, now granted, we're in Northwest Arkansas. And so in, in the area we're in, all the schools are on the same spring break holiday schedule because we're tied to the university, it's closed. And it, 
you had three different schools and kids could never match up. And so the state came in and said, listen, this is spring break and here are holidays. Uh, so what we do is that we always take the holidays the schools take. Nice. So whether it's President's Day or Martin Luther King Day, well, if your school takes MLK Day, that's the day we take because what was happening is that people were taking personal days on that holiday to be off with their kids. Well, that was not working. Mm -hmm. So it's that kind of principle-based decision-making that your, your team's like, oh, but I left a company that had 10 holidays. We have 14. Why do we have 14 here? Because that's the days your kids are getting off of school. We take those days off because yeah. you're not really going to be, you're going to, I am working at home today. I'm like, no, you're not. Take the time <laughs> off. <laughs> I get that. So there is that principle. But what we also knew uh, coming in, COVID in specifically, um, is that we really didn't come back into the office until schools and daycares were yes. available. And until then, we really didn't even, even entertain the chance of coming back in because it was too hard on our team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and especially if you have, you know, one person, if, I mean, if you have two family members, two parents, uh -huh. they're great, but if one's in person, but it, if one's, I mean, it, it just, it got hard. It got yeah, really yeah, tricky. So yeah. if people can have an employer like you that understands, Hey, you're going to take this day off anyway, because your kid's out of school, it just makes it so much easier. <laughs> Why make someone pretend? Yeah. I mean, it, it's just not realistic. So that gets back to that very specific, well, be very yes and no. And here's what we're going to do. And you listen to your team, right? I mean, yeah. I want them to be super productive and on and delivering for us when they need to be on. I want them to really be off when they're really off. And now we always have exceptions, right? I mean, there are oh, clients yeah. that expect and, but even those are truly exceptions as opposed to I'm on all the time. It, you just can't, you can't handle that. It's just too much. Mm -hmm. And, and especially like you said, those moments where you're at home, your home, but there's all these other things happening, right. right? It's the moment I walk out of the office door, everyone in my house is like, Oh, this, this, this. And I'm like, Hey guys, I just had to go to the restroom. <laughs> just give me five. Go back in. <laughs> so yeah, it's an employer like you. I'm happy for your staff just to oh, have that. Thank you. That support and that opportunity. That's huge. Yeah. And Daryl says me too. <laughs> um, so we have a few moments left. I told you this would go by super fast again with the last little bit that we have. I do have one question that I always ask, and it's really the only consistent question I have okay. because these go, these conversations go in all the directions that they should, right? Like we've talked about the open arms today and the offboarding and, and supporting your teams. I love that these conversations are fluid and open. Yeah. The only consistent question I ask is if you could summarize your company culture in particular into one word, could you do that? And what would that be? I'm not going to say maybe, or I think I can. Yes. <laughs> I don't. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that if you surveyed our team, there'll be obviously a multitude of different terms, right? Part of our values comes up around humility and community and things like that. But I think we are very intentional. Mm. And that would be the word intentional. So whether it is how do you rally to the occasion of COVID, we were intentional about that. Uh, we've got so-and-so over here that's going through a massive cancer scare. And so how can we be intentional and come alongside of him and his family, what that looks like? We've got another person over here that their grandmother's really, really ill. Well, how can we intentional and come alongside them? We've got another person over here that's brand new that is starting with the company. How can we be intentional? Uh, so we really don't walk around in this broad, vague sense of things. It's It might feel like it's too much pressure at times, like, gosh, just relax a little bit, but it should be because we're being very intentional in what we do. And then once you get into a rhythm, you're like, oh, I understand why people are pushing Mm -hmm. because they're being intentional about X onboarding. We're very intentional about that. We're intentional about training. We're very intentional about time off. We give you personal days for a reason. Mm -hmm. And it's not okay not to take them. I mean, so all that's very intentional. It's not control, I don't think controlling, but that's the word that would come to mind. And we don't apologize for it. And that's kind of the a lot of the ethos of who we are today across any facet of our organization. That's awesome. That's a great word. And I don't think 
I don't think anyone's given us that word before. So hey, see, yeah. to, that's great. <laughs> I love that. So with the last couple of moments, I want to give you the opportunity. We talked about a lot, but is there anything else um, that you want to mention? Anything about you know your company culture that you guys are doing well, or suggestions you have for other leaders that in your that are in your position? You have the floor for a moment. If you have any last notes that you want to share. That's so broad. I'm like, oh my God. I know. <laughs> you could just tell us your favorite animal, whatever you want. <laughs> well, I, I, I think it's, uh, especially if you're talking to leaders, mm -hmm. uh, don't underemphasize how important it is to develop people and processes. And it's, oh, I read the book on that. It's like, don't, there are, fancy things, there's new buzzwords, but it all comes back to people and processes. And if one of those are broke, you're toast. It, it just, and so if you're a leader looking at your organization today, if you can't articulate processes, then you're just one step away from a, a person that's a hero in your organization that saves the day every day, you're one step away from catastrophe. Mm -hmm. And if you have amazing processes and it works out really well, but the people aren't so well, they're going to break them. And it's just not going to work. So that that processes and people, Peter's people is important. Uh, but then again, not everyone's a process person. Not everyone's a people person. So as a, a CEO of the company, I've learned that I need to do things that are uniquely designed for me. And there are some things that I shouldn't or can't do. Because when I walk into a room, my words are like a thousand pounds. Everything I say, they take literally. And I can also be a buzzkill when people are having fun. So I get that. <laughs> So there's a few people on this side, but I'm a process guy. I love the processes and digging into that. Mm -hmm. I've got other people on my staff. They're just, they're the one-on-one -on -one meeting people. And they're just amazing with the people side of that. So find out where your unique, unique piece is. If it's not people or processes, I hope it's not finance and legal, <laughs> you know, but I hope it is one of those two yeah. and lean into that and really look at this year coming up. How can I really have a banner year or, or make a dramatic change to my organization of focusing on people with open hands or creating processes like we started out the conversation of the cultural processes so that it's just not how well Rick does and they're waiting for Rick to speak. It's like, no, this is who we are because if I'm hit by the lottery bus tomorrow, Kendra, listen, <laughs> if I'm hit by the lottery bus, the people should be in great shape and the processes should live on and that should be the legacy that we all leave. Yeah, yeah. That was, I... I love that as a, as a takeaway, especially I, I fit kind of in the middle. I'm such a people person, but I also want to have the process and the structure because that helps your people, right? Then everybody yes. knows that it's all connected, right? Then everyone right. knows what's expected of them and how things work and, you know, how things are going to, and that process of how it all works out. So that was an excellent, excellent takeaway. Oh, thank so, you. Now, um, first off, thank you so much. It was I, fun. I always, I love, well, obviously I love this show and I love doing this, but one of my favorite parts is Daryl, our producer sits across from me and he's the button guy and does all that makes them things magical and make them work. And he's funny because I, I watch his face when we have guests and when he's like, yeah, and he's nodding and he's into it. And I'm like, yeah, this is a good one. <laughs> So he did a lot of that today. So, oh, that's encouraging. Thank yeah. you, Daryl. Today was great. Um, so before we do officially sign off, if mm -hmm. folks have questions about you, field agent, anything like that, how can they reach you? What would be the best way for them to reach out to you? If you're a leader and trying to figure things out, uh, just DM me on LinkedIn. It's so easy to, to do that. Uh, you'd be surprised what I'd say yes to. Uh, <laughs> obviously, if you're on the... Um, want to make a few extra dollars because it would be fun, download the app. But if you're looking for, uh, whether it's a career with us, we've got like five open positions right now, or just go to our website, fieldagent.net and uh, forward slash careers, kind of look at that, or just jump into a marketplace and see what it looks like. But, but the easiest way is come right to LinkedIn. Uh, would love to hear from you. Awesome. I love that. Well, Rick, thank you again. I'm glad that it was just you and I, and we got to fill the hour today. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. I can't wait till next time. I know I'm excited. We'll do, we'll have to do another one. So yes. we'll, we'll keep that in mind. So thank you for joining us 
on the Culture Crush podcast, the podcast that does a deep dive with company leaders to learn about tips for a good culture, real life experiences, and how to share different resources to support companies in growing their company culture. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks. Thank you for listening to another episode of Culture Crush, the only podcast out there that does a deep dive of companies that are crushing it with a great company culture. If you think your company has a strong culture that should be highlighted, please reach out to Kendra Maples on LinkedIn or email us at culturecrushpodcast at gmail.com.